Hello everyone, and welcome to another special episode of Comic Book Cove. My name this week is Tamio, and I am from Thundera. And I'm Josh at Arms, and I'm from Eternia. And why are we picking names like that? Well, because our feature comic book this week is He-Man and Thundercats number one. And we are a few weeks behind on our comic book reviews because we are a few weeks behind. But this one came out this week, and it's something that we had to talk about. It was kind of cool. And as soon as I saw it, I said to Josh, here, read this. We're going to discuss it later on this week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom showed me that. I thought, oh, you know, this is just... This is just Tom sharing something really cool with me, and then I get the text later on today, like, yeah, we're going to add this to the program. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> yep. I guess I better type up discussion points for it. Exactly. So in this episode of Comic Book Cove, we're going to discuss and go over the following titles. Blue Beetle Rebirth, number one. Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps, number three. Action Comics, number 962. Wonder Woman, number five. And finally, He-Man and Thundercats, number one. And as always, spoilers ahead. Blue Beetle Rebirth number one. Will the real Blue Beetle please die? Pretty cool. Blue Beetle in DC Comics history has went through a few different changes. Originally, he was Ted Kord. Well, before that, he was... was uh, Dan Garrett. Dan was Garrett. was a cop who got a, a mystical beetle amulet or something. Okay. This is pre-DC back to um, Charlton Comics. All right. And then um, at some point he took on a sidekick, Ted Kord, who is a you know, genius inventor. Um, when Dan Garrett died, he like was going to pass the amulet to Ted Kord. Mm -hmm. Ted Kord didn't get it. Okay. So he had to just rely on his ingenuity and his yes. technological stuff. And then, of course, Ted Kord got offed in, um, what was that, Final Crisis? Infinite Crisis. Infinite Count crisis. on to Infinite Crisis. Too many crises. Crisis yes. Yeah, and then um, eventually we got uh, our new newest Blue Beetle, Jamie Reyes, yes. who has an amulet uh, scarab thing on his back that yes. kind of gives him like a kind of like an alien Iron Man meets Blue Beetle. Yeah. So so the, so this Blue Beetle rebirth now with the new Fifty Two boot Ted Quarters back. Mm -hmm. And it looks like those two are teaming up to kind of you have the mentor and you have the prodigy. They're kind of teaming up together. But Jamie Reyes is kind of trying to want to lead a teenage life. Yeah, yeah. It, it's sort of a weird, you know, you mentioned the mentor relationship. It's sort of the, like, Ted Cord wants to be a hero, doesn't have the powers. Right. Jamie Reyes has the powers and doesn't want to be a hero at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, throughout most of this this issue... Jamie is kind of dreading any time his, his beetle suit, you know, causes them to, right. to do anything. And so uh, it's it's funny, and then Ted Kord sits back and says, oh, that was really cool. You should really, we should really analyze that more. Mm -hmm. So it's it's an interesting, interesting juxtaposition of characters, and that's kind of how I expected them if they ever met, and finally they meet. What This issue kind of starts off with, we see Jamie Reyes the Reyes family going through everyday life as a teenager. And then when he's leaving out with his friends, he gets a call from Ted Cord and the two, <clears throat> excuse me. And one of the coffee shops are getting attacked by a uh, rack and ruin two mm. figures. They turn out to be kind of like robots that were hired to draw them out. And Jamie doesn't want to do it because if he does go, he's going to be another tardy for school. <laughs> And then he'll get detention. So as he's fighting, it was kind of the Ted Cord is in his ear telling him what to do, how to do it. And Jamie Reyes is having a, the dialogue back and forth. And it makes for an interesting issue with because the robots are kind of, who is he talking to? What's distracting yeah, him? How yeah. is he going to do that? And Ted Cord is, well, did you try this? Yeah, I did. A lot of banter back and forth. Yeah, he, the Rack and Ruin mentioned that uh, Jamie was very... Um, like muttering to himself, right? Like, sort of like the non sequitur muttering, and so they right. were kind of on to on to that. I, I kind of like that rack and ruin. They're kind of kind of weird with that big weird grin on yes. their faces, and yeah, real eloquent as they yep. threaten people and and you know nearly tore Jamie apart. It was very very strange, but sort of what I expected for Blue Beetle villains. <laughs> and then they left, 
yeah. uh, after what they were talking to their boss on the other line mm -hmm. and finding out that he, uh, Blue Beetle was talking to someone. So that was kind of, okay, we didn't get paid for what we're going to do. We'll go off and go do something next time. Yeah, But it was also, I thought, was kind of cool with Jamie Reyes, his two friends. One was named Brenda, and I'm not sure what the other... Um, Paco? I Paco, think? yes. I, I think. Paco, I think you're right. Yeah. They were having a kind of a little spat, and Paco said something at the very beginning that really didn't make much sense, but they put it in, that Paco had said, bless you, when Brenda sneezed, and she was uh, saying, well, this is superstitious. Well, don't think much of it. You really don't until you get to the end of the book. And when Brenda comes home, she lives with her aunt. And her aunt's name is Amper Amparo? Am Amparo? Yeah. Amparo. I think. We find out that she is the one that hired the two um, Rack and Ruin to go after the Blue Beetle. Mm -hmm. But now she finds out that there is, um, there's two of them. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't really fond of that. She said that wasn't work. But it looked like she was some type of witch yeah. with some magical powers. So... I wonder if that was kind of a connection to alluding to she's that Brenda is superstitious, doesn't like being superstitious for these reasons. When I read through it, my takeaway from it was maybe she was attempting to study the blue beetle. Yes. I mean the scarab, so maybe it would be more of a technological right. um a technological aspect. Maybe that would be kind of more of an aversion to superstition too, mm -hmm. but we'll we'll have to see. But um we do get one very mystical sort yes. of epilogue to this, which is Dr. Fate showing up. Yes. And that, that made me happy, because anything with Dr. Fate makes me happy. That was totally unexpected. Why don't you go ahead and yeah. talk about well, that um, one? Dr. Fate shows up in um, Ted Cord's lab right. and scares the crap out of him. And he starts to warn Ted about um, Jamie's scarab. And Ted seems to say, well, you know, we kind of have this under control. We're, we're figuring out what it is. And Dr. Fate says, no, this isn't, um, it's, not an extra, it's not an extraterrestrial artifact, as it had been originally. Yes. Um, when it was first bonded to him, it was from an alien race called the Reach, and they're sort of an insect-like, um, they kind of have insect armor uh, like Blue Beetle does. And so that was sort of the established origin of where it came from, and Dr. Fate says, no, it's not extraterrestrial, it's mystical in nature. So they have you know, they sort of have no idea what they're dealing with. So it's, it's. I found it was kind of taking Jamie's character back to Dan Garrett's character, you know, with yes. the, the mystical aspect. What what was your thoughts when you read Blue Beetle overall on this rebirth, kind of a new starting point with a lot of technology, mysticism, and Dr. Fate? I wasn't expecting to see him, mm -hmm. and it was very ominous. As I read it, I thought it was really really good starting point because Ted Cord was a favorite character during kind of the middle run of DC during the Infinite Crisis right before that. Mm -hmm. And New 52 and pre-Flashpoint Jamie Reyes was a cool character. Yeah. He joined the, Titan, the Teen Titans for a little bit. He was a player. Mm -hmm. So I enjoyed it. I think this would be really good. But what do you think we look forward to in Blue Beetle? Um, I'm, I'm curious to see if, at first I got to see if Ted Cord actually dons the suit and gets out there. I mean, instead of just staying on the bug and, and feeding Jamie information. And I am curious to see not only who's trying to draw them out, and then what's what's the new origin going to be of Jamie's um, Jamie's scarab. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think it was a really smart move to do both of them together. Because, I mean, like you said, those are two characters who each have their own individual followings. You know, I mean... Uh, you know, Ted Cord was popular, like, from the Justice League International days and stuff. So it's it's smart to put them together, and it's it's nice to get that combination of characters, yes. too, because that works pretty well. And if Ted Cord is back, can we have Booster Gold be far behind? Mm -hmm. This yeah. might be a Justice League International reunion. We'll see what happens. I enjoy it. Josh likes it. And we'll keep talking about it in the weeks ahead mm -hmm. and who knows when the watchmen show up night owl might join this and we might have three blue beetle like characters <laughs> floating around real quick why don't you go into the history of the watchmen and the charlton characters because you bring up something i didn't even think yeah. about until just now yeah so when uh when 
the Watchmen series was first in the works. Um, Alan Moore was a big fan of Charlton Comics. They were uh, a rival publishing company to DC. They were eventually purchased by them, and most of their characters were slowly added in to uh, to that. And we had characters like The Question, um, Blue Beetle, um, guys like uh, Thunderbolt. You know, some of those went on to fairly big fame. I mean, Blue Beetle was probably the most famous of that group. Um, you know, The Question was, was in there. Thunderbolt kind of had his his time. Uh, the Peacemaker was in there. Yes. Um, and so Alan Moore wanted, when they first purchased the rights to Charlton, Alan Moore wanted to take the Charlton characters and use them in his own comic. Mm -hmm. And DC said, no, we don't want to do that. We want to take those characters, add them into the mainstream DC universe. So what Moore did was he took sort of combined versions of them. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, characters heavily based on those to create the Watchmen. So you end up with, you know, Blue Beetle and Night Owl, The Question and Rorschach, mm -hmm. um, The Peacemaker and The Comedian. It's So it, it was an interesting combination is that we end up with these, um, you know, sort of alter egos yes. of them. And some of that, like with um, with Captain Adam, who I forgot about, yes. is with New 52 Captain Adam, they really rolled him back towards the Dr. Manhattan side. And he had blue skin, he had the little yeah. dot on his head. It's like, whoa, he's he looks like Dr. Manhattan. So um, it, it'll be interesting to see if they end up meeting. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll look forward to that in the weeks ahead. Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corpse number three. Sinestro's Law Part 3, Innocence Lost. I'll let you start this one off, Josh. Well, it's, I mean, it's very much a continuation of where we were last time. The um, John Stewart and the rest of the Green Lantern Corps are still on that planet in seemingly the middle of nowhere. They have no, I want to say no cell reception, but they have no, <laughs> they have no ring reception. Right. <laughs> and so, so John can't contact Guy Gardner, who we sent out on his little reconnaissance mission. They can't, um, they can't even figure out where he is because they don't have their positioning right. system. And um, last we see of Guy Gardner, he's somewhere fighting some people who we little, only see in shadow. And he, he has his own little fight club, it seems like. Yeah. He's going to his little fight club blowing off steam. Yeah. But where is he? Why yeah. they're all on Mogo and Jon Stewart's literally just banging his head. Where are you at, Guy? Recon report, yeah. recon report. You, they have a panel, Guy Gardner with bloody knuckles fighting some people mm -hmm. just because he, he wants to blow off steam. Yeah, and he says, yeah, just help me blow off some steam. So it'll be interesting to see where he is. I mean, if it's a friendly place of the galaxy or, or not. Right. It looks like it isn't. But we know that where Hal Jordan is, and he's still fighting off the Sinestro Corps, and he's holding his own. And at the same time, though, something's happening with the... Um, the Sinestro Corps are going throughout the sector with the Sinestro order to instill great fear. Mm -hmm. And every time these people are getting very f afraid, a lot of fear going on, they seem to be recharging the Sinestro Corps and almost overcharging the rings because you see percentages going up to 100, 110, mm -hmm. 140. Yeah. And Hal Jordan is able to fight most of it off, but finally he's just overwhelmed by the odds and the power. Yeah. And that was, whoa, yep. he put up a fight. Well, and added to the fact that he's fighting, what did he say, 12 Sinestro Corps members yes. at that point? I mean, that, you know, because that was the uh, the backup yes. for the other ones, which are, unfortunately, it gets to the point where I can't name every single Sinestro Corps member. And they didn't name them in the issue either. No, they so didn't. <laughs> who knows? But, um, yeah, it, and they mention in their little fight that there's a, uh, a fear engine yes. that Sinestro is working on. So it makes me wonder if that's, if sort of this terrorism the mm -hmm. um you know the sinestro corps is doing elsewhere is being pulled through the sphere engine and then being redistributed to all the other sinestro corps members rings what was also yeah because what was also interesting is as they were attacking instilling fear people were saying you were supposed to protect us the sinestro mm -hmm. corps we believed in you were to protect them mm -hmm. but they're going to instill fear and they're just kind of overpowering the rings. There's also another point into this issue where Sinestro is visited by a partner with a group called the uh, Sacrament mm -hmm. that seems to be 
some type of ambassadors. Yeah, yeah, some sort of like uh, religious order. Yes. Almost, and they they visit him on Warworld, and Sinestro explains that um, the Sinestro Corps is eliminating whatever their mm -hmm. opposition is for their teachings. Yep. So um, it, it makes me wonder what exactly they'll be teaching if that's. You know, if they're worshipping Parallax or mm -hmm. if they're worshipping Sinestro, which I could totally see. Yeah. I mean, he would <laughs> he would probably enjoy that quite oh, a bit. Definitely. But it also has it also has um Sora Naknatu pretty concerned. Because mm -hmm. she overhears some of that and, and she's not familiar with that, so it could be maybe another you know, another straw on the camel's back. I, I think, think before so. she before she turns on Sinestro. Sinestro's always been very ego driven. And he does things for Sinestro. Mm -hmm. And as long as, they said, as long as you're worshipping fear, and by fear, me, everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. If not, then you're not, if you're not of use to me, then you're not of use to anyone. Mm -hmm. and yeah. You can go away. Yeah. Well, and it's funny you mentioned ego, too, because in that um, the dialogue he has with the sacrament, he's floating yes. the entire time. I mean, he he's yeah. not that far above him, but he's above them yep i mean he's not walking alongside and i thought that was that was just a great you know Very image purposeful. where he's i mean it shows his authority it shows mm -hmm. kind of the fear he could instill too yeah very dictatorship mm -hmm. he has the shoulder pads and the cape flowing mm -hmm. he really is living up to the part right now such a good look yep. such a good look <laughs> finally I, I i do enjoy it with the uh you know the parallax mm -hmm. giving you shoulder pads and yeah. The cape. It, it's a nice... It's it a it nice is work. really intimidating. It mm -hmm. re if he's going for that, he definitely has it. Uh, do you think there's any correlation maybe between this fear um, this uh, fear engine and the Hell Tower that we saw from the Red Lantern? So maybe I, trying to grow some new type of entity? Yeah, me, I, I was definitely thinking they're both sort of, um, you know, efforts by the Sinestro Corps and the Red Lantern Corps sort of to preserve their... Right. Um, their hold on the galaxy. I mean, the, it sounds like the Red Lantern Corps is trying to. Is, this is sort of like their last ditch effort to still exist. Right. To have a planet that you know can sustain rage for that long, which is Earth. Mm -hmm. and, but then, I mean, it's so it's sort of like the same concept, but done differently, where the Red Lanterns are focusing all their time on one planet, and the Sinestro Corps is going seemingly everywhere. Yep. To, to terrorize, you know, to just terrorize people. So it's, it's almost like, um, you know, state-sponsored terrorism. Yes. Yeah. I mean, they're not quite a state, but it's mm -hmm. it's along that lines. Well, Hal Jordan at the very end is defeated, and they're going to take him to Sinestro. Ah, so this is a pretty kind of a straightforward issue, but if the overpowered Sinestro corps are going, Hal Jordan doesn't have much of a chance against the odds. Mm-hmm. Maybe in the next issue or so, maybe the Green Lantern Corps finally, Mogo gets going. They find and even up the odds. Because right now, Sinestro arrogantly thinks that it's only Hal Jordan left for the Green Lantern Corps. So that might mm -hmm. be to Hal Jordan's advantage. He doesn't know that they're back really either. Mm -hmm. So it might be a surprise for them. Yeah, yeah. I think in some ways it might be right where Hal Jordan wants to be. Because mm -hmm. he'll be face to face with Sinestro again. So yes. even if he can't defeat him... Physically, he might be able to just psych him out enough. And one last thing. Do you think that Sinestro is going to try to take over other sectors as he instills great fear and use the fear engine, his slash war world? I don't know if the fear engine and the war world are the same, but it seems like that's what he's doing is he's yeah. going to a uh, military type. Yeah, could uh, be could be something martial on, law. on war world. Mm -hmm. But uh, plus, I mean, they're also considering themselves the successors of the Green Lantern Corps. Yes. And the Green Lantern Corps was everywhere. I mean, that was basically every space sector. So it seems like if he's not to that point, he would want to be to that mm -hmm. point to, you know, to solidify his um, claim to be the successor to the Green right. Lantern Corps. This was a good issue. What did you feel about the issue? It was good. I mean, it, it's, still, it's still very much a, a continuation of where we were. We didn't get that many more answers, but we have... A few more questions, yes, too. So enough to <laughs> enough to string us along for exactly. Intergalactic uh, adventures are always fun to read when they're done right. And Green Lantern 
so far has been done right. Mm -hmm. So I'm enjoying it. Josh is enjoying it. Straightforward issue. We'll see what happens in the next couple issues on where it stands if, with Sinestro, Hal Jordan, uh, Sinestro's daughter, and the rest of the core. Mm -hmm. With that, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we are going to discuss Action Comics number 962 and Wonder Woman number five. We'll be right back.